So let's begin um, continuing our path integral discussion. Here I again show one of the main results of this morning, namely the general path integral which describes the following, a matrix element between a Heisenberg state defined at some uh, initial time ti and another Heisenberg state at some final time tf. And in between there is a time ordered product of operators which uh, in this case should depend on the q's and p's, the operators. And uh, this general matrix element is given as a path integral over the paths of q and the paths of p. And here we just have the classical expressions of the corresponding operators with number valued arguments. And here the exponent is uh, this object which looks like the Lagrangian but isn't the Lagrangian because the p and q's and q dots are still independent variables. Now let us go on. We have discussed uh, the transition from the Hamiltonian to the Lagrangian picture. And I gave you already a semi-simple case, which is not completely uh, obvious, uh, where the Legendre transformation in the path integral works. And now we want to discuss even more general cases. So let me immediately jump right in. What happens if the Hamiltonian contains terms which are quadratic in the piece, like we have assumed this morning, but the coefficient is now not only a matrix, but it is a matrix which depends on the Q's. A matrix which depends on the Q variables, such that the coefficient of the piece in the Hamiltonian is a more complicated function. And then there might be some other terms. If that happens, you can still uh, do the Gaussian integral, but the prefactor is now uh, containing, um, this normalization prefactor is now containing the determinant of the prefactor matrix, but the prefactor matrix now depends on Q. Therefore, the determinant which appears by doing the integral over P will be a function of Q therefore a complicated additional uh, piece in the final result. A piece in the final result which will not uh, be of the form e to the i times the action, but an additional factor which is just the functional determinant of the matrix A, which is a functional of Q. Therefore, that provides an example where the path integral will not have the form uh, integral over Q times e to the i times the action. It's just a counterexample. So here, the path integral will contain the functional determinant of this matrix A of Q to the power minus one half, uh, which is a non-trivial dependence on the Q's and therefore the final result would be a path integral with a structure like this, dQ of t times some other factors maybe times this determinant of the matrix A of Q to the power minus one half times e to the i times integral of the Lagrangian. That is the least that will happen in such a case. And so that provides an example where uh, the general thing that you might always imagine is not correct. So here it's a more complicated situation. And there are some quantum field theories which have such a behavior, for example, effective theories. And uh, in those cases, then simply uh, the path integral looks like this. Another case which we should discuss is uh, in the case of constraints. You know, uh, this type of constraints in the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formalism, where the Legendre transformation is also non-trivial, which we have discussed in quantum field theory one. And uh, as you already know from quantum field theory one, uh, 
The case of constraints is very important in quantum field theory. It appears in very many very relevant field theories already in the Dirac theory, but also in the uh, case of vector bosons, both with masses and without masses. Therefore, constraints should be dealt with and we should understand how to use them. And so that is the main point I want to discuss now. And uh, that is the general result I want to give you. I will now spell out a few conditions under which the usual thing with just the action in the exponent is correct. Uh, and the list is long. And we will then provide examples. And you will discover that those examples are exactly the relevant ones. So assume the following case. Namely, we allow second class constraints which are the simpler kind of constraints. You remember first class constraints are gauge invariances. Second class constraints are those ones where you can eliminate something by using the equations of motion. And uh, so this is what we allow. Then we have variables in our theory, which we give uh, typical names, let's say Q1 or QI in general, PI. Those variables are unconstrained. And we have an additional set of variables. Let's call them QBI. B always for me stands for an auxiliary field, which is constrained. QBI and PBI of some number, they are constrained. Then we assume the following form of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian should have a first part, which I call L0, which contains only the unconstrained variables Q and Q dot. And this Lagrangian should be, as in the previous section, so that we already know that for this one alone, the transition in the path integral works. And then comes the dependence on the extra constraint variables, and I assume the following form, which is in all relevant cases true. Namely, 1 half times a matrix small a i j times q b i q b j. So a quadratic form in the constraint position variables plus q b i times the following another matrix Bij times Qj dot plus Ci of Q. Okay, and uh, maybe later I will abbreviate this whole thing as Fi of Q and Q dot. So what do we have here? We have the following. The Lagrangian does not contain Qb dot. So the, these variables, which I call constraint variables, their time derivative does not appear. That is why they are constrained. But the QBs on their own, they appear, and they appear only in a quadratic form. Here, the, the worst that can appear is a quadratic thing, which has a constant coefficient. And then they appear linearly, and the linear term contains uh, the velocities of the normal variables and some thing like an arbitrary function of the normal variables. Okay, that is the structure. And you will see that in all our relevant examples, this structure is fulfilled. And that is the structure we can deal with. And I can tell you immediately that for this structure, um, the transition to the Lagrangian in the path integral works completely. So let's write down some facts. So the derivative dl by the QBI dot, that would be the definition of the momentum, right? The canonical momentum. But this derivative is zero. And that means there is no canonical momentum for those QB variables. 
That is the point, and that is what we mean by constraint. That is a constraint. And then the dl by dqb without dot, that is not 0, but that is this f, uh, sorry, uh, a i j q j plus f i of q and q dot. And uh, the equation of motion for uh, those qb variables, the equation of motion would be uh, that this is equal to the time derivative of that. Uh, the time derivative of that is 0. Therefore, the equation of motion tells us that this should be 0 as well. So the equation, equation of motion tells us that this object here should be 0. And now we assume uh, that the matrix here is invertible. This matrix here should be invertible. Otherwise, the construction also doesn't make sense. And then we can solve the equation of motion for the, sorry, QB. We can solve the equation of motion for the QBs, namely QBJ or QBI would be this matrix small a to the minus 1 ij uh, minus times fj of q in q dot. So this is the solution of the equation of motion. And this is another constraint. So on the level of phase space, the whole theory is only defined on the sub-manifold of the phase space where uh, this equation and that equation is valid. Outside of that sub-manifold, the phase space cannot be reached in this theory. So that is what we call a constraint. And the statement is the following. Under this condition, the correct path integral is the following namely qf tf then time ordered product of some operators in the same sense as before if they only depend on the q's not to the p's q uh, q's and they might even depend on the qb's which are constrained but not on the p's qi ti that is given by what you expect, namely just the path integral over q, including the path integral over the constraint variables qb, just over all variables which exist, then all these operators om of q tm Q, B, T, M, and then the exponent e to the i times integral of the Lagrangian L, D, T. So that is the most naive path integral that you can think of. You just uh, ignore everything about all difficulties, forget about constraints, forget about variables, just take the Lagrangian as it stands, take all the variables which it depends on, all position variables, integrate over them, and that gives the correct result. And this can be proven on exactly this general level, but uh, I'm not going to prove it. Let me just write it down. We will give the proof for specific examples. Why? Because then you will see which examples this corresponds to, and you will see exactly the application, and you see why exactly this structure is important, and also why it is sufficient. We will discuss the exact notation, which is the field theory notation where this will be important instead of using an abstract notation which will never be used again. And uh, the 
structure of the proof is of course exactly the same regardless whether you work in an example or in the general case. That's the point. Very good. Okay, therefore let's go to the examples and in case you have forgotten what constraints are and so on, then uh, this will also probably become clear again from looking at the examples. So, I will go through three examples and uh, so let's put that here, 1.5 relevant quantum field theory examples. And uh, let me already point out uh, what we will do now is basically an answer to the discussion at the end of our section, so what was it, 338 in quantum field theory one from last semester. Because there we discussed the deri derivation of Feynman rules and I gave you a long list of very general Feynman rules and uh, we derived them at an example. Namely, we derived them for QED and then I said uh, the same Feynman rules and the same recipe is always true. But I also told you that the derivation is sometimes extremely awkward because there are certain problems in the derivation and I told you that in quantum field theory two, we will solve those problems and that is now. So therefore, uh, please have a look once again at those remarks over there and see uh, the derivation of Feynman rules in the canonical operator framework and then we will compare it to here. So we will actually not immediately derive the Feynman rules but what we will derive now is the path integral where you will already sense uh, why and how th uh, the problems that we encountered there can be solved and in the next lecture we will also look at the Feynman rule derivation from the path integral and then it will turn out to obviously avoid all those problems and directly lead to the rules which I have already stated there. The first example is a scalar field with derivative couplings. scalar field with derivative couplings. Let me write the Lagrangian and then clean the blackboard. So the Lagrangian would be this, uh, one half d mu phi, d mu phi minus m square over two phi square minus j mu d mu phi minus the potential v of phi. And this term here is the special term which is now new and which contains derivative interactions. So this J is basically just an abbreviation for some interaction of d mu phi with some other fields. We don't specify which fields these are. It might be a product of some other fields, but we don't care about that. We only care about the phi dependence and here there is a derivative of phi in the interaction term. And that is something for which I already gave you the recipe to read of the Feynman rules, but I told you that the derivation is more complicated. Okay, and so let us now look at this. So let's look at this and really go through the canonical procedure, which is the procedure that we have trained ourselves to do in the last semester. So for those of you who were not there, uh, okay, you can still follow, I hope, canonical procedure. But for those ones who were in the last semester, this is now a Pavlov's reflex because we did it so many times for so many different cases, but not for this one. Okay, so what happens? We need to first look at the conjugate canonical momentum pi, which is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot. The derivative with respect to phi dot. 
So what, where is phi dot? Phi dot appears here, phi dot square for the d0 derivative. So the derivative gives us phi dot. Here there is no phi dot, but here there is another phi dot, namely minus j0. So phi dot, for those who forgot, is the same as this and also the same as this because we use a metric where for the time component the upper and lower index is the same. Okay, so that is our conjugate momentum. Uh, so we can solve that for phi dot. Phi dot is then pi plus j0. And in the usual case where we have a free scalar field like this one, uh, we would just have phi dot equal pi. And now we have phi dot equal pi plus this uh, additional term. Then our Hamiltonian, our Hamiltonian is a d3x integral over some Hamiltonian density. And the Hamiltonian density is given now by the uh, Legendre transformation, namely pi times phi dot minus L. And uh, OK, so we can plug in everything, pi. Um, uh, and we have to eliminate, of course, phi dot by saying phi dot is equal to pi plus j0. That is part of the definition of the Hamiltonian. So let's plug it in. Phi dot is replaced by that. So we get here uh, one term is pi square. And here from the Lagrangian, we also have one half phi dot square. That also gives us uh, one half pi square. 1 pi square minus 1 half pi square is 1 half pi square. And then from here, we have the spatial derivative terms. They Here, they come with a minus because of the metric. And in minus L, they come with a plus. So plus 1 half gradient phi square. Then we have here plus m square over 2 times phi square and plus the potential v of phi. And here, now I've really calculated just all the terms without uh, the current j. And now let's care about all the terms involving the current j. So where are those terms? So one term is here from pi times phi dot. Phi dot contains j0, so we get here pi times j0. Here from this, 1 half times that thing, uh, here we get a square terms, phi dot square. We get pi times j, uh, 2 times pi times j cancels the 1 half. So this term drops out, I would say. Um, and anything else? Yeah, here, uh, j0 times phi dot once again. So from here we then get finally once more j0 times pi, so one term plus j0 times pi remains. Then what else do we have? We have from here the spatial components plus ji times di phi. And uh, then from here we had pi, z, pi dot square, uh, which gives us one term j0 square. So plus minus 1 half j0 square. And that's it, I would say. Good. So, and now we can look at the terms a little bit. So this first part here, this would be the free Hamiltonian of the free scalar theory that we discussed in quantum field theory one, which has absolutely no interactions. Uh, and so we discussed that and did canonical quantization of exactly this expression. This comes from ordinary interactions with a potential. And that is the new term, term coming from the derivative interactions. And all of it is the Hamiltonian density. And so now you see the problem which I already mentioned last semester. Namely here there is something which is not Lorentz covariant. We simply have the zero component j0 square in the Hamiltonian, just like that. So this is not Lorentz covariant. 
Okay, uh, none of the terms are Lorentz covariant, okay, but this is particularly non covariant, is even less covariant than all the other terms in some sense. So it's a square term in J, but just involving the J0 component. And uh, so then the other thing in uh, the derivation of perturbation theory, uh, we would encounter an interaction picture and so on, and then at some point there is an interaction Hamiltonian, which is everything except for the free Hamiltonian. So everything except for this bracket. And we uh, simply said, usually, this is equal to minus the interaction Lagrangian density. And that was usually true. But here it's not true, because the interaction Lagrangian density is just this here. Very simple and very Lorentz invariant. But uh, the interaction Hamiltonian is totally non-Lorentz covariant and is definitely not equal to minus L int. So this was also a remark that I made, that uh, this relationship that we always used is sometimes wrong. Here it is wrong. So that is not true. Here we have something non-Lorentz covariant. And in the operator formalism, all of this is what we would need to use. We would have to use exactly this. We would, have, we would not be allowed to use the directly L int. We would need to use this uh, Hamiltonian density uh, in order to derive Feynman rules. Then we would have, of course, not Lorentz invariant Feynman rules, special vertices involving just this, and so on. So that is what we would need to use in the operator formalism. But now let's look at the path integral. So let's look at some final state at Tf and some time-ordered product of some operators, O1 of phi, and so on, Om of phi, some initial state. We know that the correct path integral is really the one with the Hamiltonian, and where we integrate over position and momentum variables. So here we integrate over the field and the conjugate momentum field. So that is clearly correct. And then we have an exponential of the integral over the Hamiltonian minus this other thing. So we have this pi phi dot minus h integrated over d4x. This is our correct path integral, and we know it's correct. We have derived it simply under the condition that there is a Hamiltonian framework. We have a Hamiltonian framework, therefore we know that this is correct. And this is also not Lorentz covariant because it has exactly the same problem inherited from the Hamiltonian framework. So here we have our uh, weird-looking Hamiltonian density. But now we can use the transition of the path integral from Hamiltonian to Lagrangian, and then all the problems will dissolve. So, uh, right. Let's say, let's call this again e to the i times sigma. Sigma is basically the exponent. Then we see sigma is, uh, has the form basically something involving pi square plus something involving pi plus terms which are not pi dependent. And the coefficient of pi square is an invertible constant which does not depend on the fields, is one half. So therefore, uh, our conditions for doing the Gaussian integral are satisfied. We can do the Gaussian integral. It is trivial. It will lead to a normalization prefactor, which depends on nothing. Therefore, we can ignore the normalization prefactor. And then the Gaussian integral will simply have the effect, as we discussed, to replace this object by itself 
where we evaluate it at a stationary point. And that then corresponds to the Legendre transformation. So here this is constant and invertible. So we can integrate over the pi and the result will be e to the i sigma where we must replace pi by pi star where pi star is defined such that the variational derivative here of sigma with respect to pi at pi equal pi star vanishes. And this condition here, the stationary point condition, is of course nothing but saying that phi dot is equal to the derivative of h with respect to pi, which is the Legendre transformation. Therefore, this result here at this uh, stationary point of pi is nothing but e to the i times the integral of the Lagrangian L d4x. And that is now the original full Lagrangian with all its details, with all its terms, but in particular the Lorentz invariant form of the Lagrangian. So here in this small sequence of steps, all the known Lorentz invariant stuff has completely dropped out. And we can simply say, let's call this star. This is our original path integral. And uh, to have a nice result at the end, this star is now really equal to path integral over only the fields d phi of x. Then all the operators. And then e to the i times integral over L d4x. As simple as that. And here we have the fully Lorentz invariant Lagrangian density, which originally defined our theory. Okay, so this is the outcome of that analysis. So this is the first example, which is already a non-trivial example, where the power and the magic of the path integral becomes visible. And its great advantage over the canonical formalism becomes obvious. So the next step could then be to read off Feynman rules from here. We will learn how to do that in the next lecture. And then those Feynman rules will immediately be automatically Lorentz invariant. Any questions? Yep. Where we have this inequality exponent, um, that's one of these cases where we have the implicit assumption that all the fields vanish uh, sufficiently fast for the integral to be finite. OK, uh, here we have this path integral with the specific initial and final states at specific times, which are not infinite. And so therefore, the boundary condition of the path integral is that the field configurations at those times match the fields which are specified by the initial and final state. So these are boundary conditions of the field at finite times. And uh, um, here, the integral goes from uh, ti to tf, not from minus infinity to plus infinity. Of course, in the spatial sense, uh, uh, for spatial x, the integral goes to infinity. And uh, then, of course, it depends on the boundary conditions that you have put here for those initial and final states. I mean, the uh, integral is proved to be the same as the original matrix element. And if the original matrix element is finite, um, then this integral will also be finite. Sometimes, however, of course, matrix elements between non-normalizable states in quantum mechanics might be a delta function and so on, and then you cannot expect this to converge as well. But if you choose here a matrix element between uh, states which are normalizable and so on, uh, 
such that the original left-hand side of the equation is finite, then the integral is guaranteed to be finite as well. Okay, because here uh, sigma is an integral over all field configurations and here I would use a functional derivative with respect to one particular point uh, pi at some x, specifically at some value of x. That should be zero. That is the same kind of functional derivative as you are using in classical mechanics to minimize the action. There you have a functional of uh, or a function of time. Here we have a function of time and space, but it's the same idea. That was already an important example, which appears in actual physics applications, but um, the example did not yet contain constraints. But nevertheless, it was already interesting to look at. And uh, maybe let me give you a reference so you can find more about this example also in Weinberg's book, section uh, 7.5 and section 9.3. So the discussion of this is spread over exactly those two sections. Now let us look at the next example, the massive vector field. The Lagrangian density is minus 1 over 4 f mu nu f mu nu uh, plus m square over 2 a mu a mu uh, minus j mu a mu. So this is the normal field strength tensor, which is an abbreviation for this anti-symmetric derivative. This is a mass term for a vector field. And the combination of the two terms is something that we quantized in quantum field theory one with the result of finding um, a massive spin one field uh, and a massive spin one particle in the spectrum of the theory. And the interesting detail was that we have four components of our field, A mu, which runs from zero to three, four components. Therefore, four degrees of freedom on the level of field variables but the physical spin one particle has only three spin degrees of freedom, spin plus one, minus one, and zero. Therefore, there is a mismatch of the number of field variables and the number of particle degrees of freedom, and the mismatch is taken into account by the fact that this Lagrangian is one which has constraints. It has one constraint, and this constraint eliminates essentially one degree of freedom, and we discussed all of that in our discussion in quantum field theory one. Now we look at the uh, Lagrangian of that massive vector field and add an interaction. This is an interaction term, again in some generic form, where I just put in some j. We do not uh, ask what is this j in detail. It is, uh, at least it shouldn't contain the a mu, but otherwise it is whatever it is. And uh, it corresponds to some interaction, which we would now like to take into account in order to understand how we can derive Feynman rules for such a field uh, theory with interactions. So the equation of motion corresponding to that Lagrangian, if you do Euler Lagrange as usual, gives you d mu f mu nu from the field strength tensor plus m square a nu now minus j nu. So this thing here was the equation of motion that we quantized, and that is now an additional term. So let us go through the canonical procedure again. And of course, we did that, except for with a J, we did it in quantum field theory one. 
So we pay particular attention to the trade-dependent terms, but let's go through the steps. First, the definition of the conjugate momenta, pi mu, is given by the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to a dot mu, with upper and lower indices like that. And uh, then, so the question is, where appears a dot mu, or the zero derivative of a mu? So it appears within the field strength tensor in f mu nu, f mu nu. So one term here from this, the one over four cancels, and we get just minus f zero mu from that derivative here. Then the second term does not contain it, and the third term uh, uh, okay, that's it. Uh, so there is no other term. So that is just the canonical momentum. Okay, but let's uh, look at it in some detail. So actually, what happens for mu equals zero? So what is the canonical momentum for the A zero field? It is zero because the field strength tensor is anti-symmetric. F zero zero vanishes. So for the field A0, we get the canonical momentum vanishes. And that is a, a constraint. That is what we call a constraint. So there is no, uh, the phase space of this theory does not uh, lead to points where pi0 is unequal to 0. So the phase space is not a full eight-dimensional space, but uh, only a six-dimensional submanifold is filled with valid points. And so here in the other case, we can get rid of the minus and write it as plus f i zero, where mu is equal to i. That is unconstrained. Then, is this a first class or a second class constraint? Who knows it? Mr. Schäuble. Uh, in order for it to be second class, we need to find a second constraint uh, with which together this forms a pair. And so let us find this uh, second constraint. So let's look at the equation of motion. Here is the equation of motion in general, but let's look specifically at the equation of motion for our constraint field A0. What is the equation of motion for the constraint field M square A0? Uh, is equal to j0 minus uh, d mu f mu nu. Um, and so here, f0. So we only get spatial indices here because the f0 zero, zero vanishes. So that's all we have. And then you see that actually uh, this here is the canonical momentum. So we can also write this as j0 minus di times pi i. That is our equation of motion. And this is also a constraint because it gives a relationship between our field variable and other field variables and canonical momenta without time derivative. Such a thing is also a constraint. So again, you cannot choose initial conditions uh, for the time derivative and so on for this field. But A0 basically is an abbreviation for other phase space variables. Once those phase space variables are fixed, A0 is fixed as well. That is also a constraint. And now uh, that is the thing of second class and first class constraints. Second class constraints are those ones where you can form a pair of two constraints here, one constraint for A0 and another constraint for pi0. And the Poisson bracket between the two doesn't vanish. So the Poisson bracket between A0 and pi0, of course, doesn't vanish. So that was the criterion. And so here, that criterion is fulfilled. So therefore, we have here a second class constraints. And if you don't know what we are talking about, because you missed the lecture last year, um, then uh, you can look it up. But the point is simply first class constraints uh, gauge theories 
This is not a gauge invariance, but it's a second class constraint. And as you see from the concrete formula, what that simply means is that you can view A0 as an abbreviation of something else. And then you can eliminate. You can just, wherever you see A0, you can now plug in this expression or that expression. It's just an abbreviation. And so you can completely eliminate A0 from the Lagrangian and then go on. That is the simple procedure. OK, uh, in order to proceed, what we also need is uh, the time derivative, so a dot with index i. A dot with index i, uh, this is here, contained here, is equal to um, di of a0 minus pi i. So this would be a way in the Legendre transformation to eliminate the time derivatives of our field variables. They, by eliminating them, we encounter our A0, but A0 can then be replaced by uh, whatever it is using the equation of motion and the constraint. So having all that, we can, um, okay, maybe let me introduce an abbreviation. Let's call it L constraint. L constraint would be the Lagrangian where we implement everything I said, namely we eliminate A0 by its solution of the equation of motion. So you would eliminate A0 by plugging in this relationship, then A0 doesn't exist anymore. And uh, then, of course, the Lagrangian looks a little bit different. And if you imagine writing it down explicitly, we will not write it down, but it would become quite lengthy. And it also would look completely non Lorentz invariant because A0 is then singled out. You replace A0 by this sum. And then, for example, here in the mass term, you would have a mass term for the spatial components AI, AI. That looks OK. Then you have A0 square. A0 square would be replaced by the square of this. And so then you would encounter such terms in the Lagrangian. And that is the Lagrangian, which I call L constraint. And that is the basis of our canonical quantization procedure. So then we, uh, and also that is what we did in quantum field theory one, except that the J was not there, but everything else is, uh, was there and we, we dealt with it. So then the Hamiltonian density is pi i times a dot i minus the Lagrangian density of this constraint Lagrangian, where the a0 does not appear anymore at all. It's completely eliminated. And so this Hamiltonian density, which we obtain in this way, can be, of course, split into a term which does not contain the j and a term which contains the j. And the term without j is exactly the one from the last semester. And the term with j is new. So uh, this calculation is maybe a little bit uh, awkward and time consuming and boring. And since it's not covariant, it's exactly the opposite of elegant. Uh, therefore, let's just copy the result from last semester, minus 1 half pi i pi i. Uh, plus 1 over 2 m square times di pi i dj pi j plus 1 over 4 f i j f i j minus m square over 2 a i a i. That is the term from last semester. And so here, for example, uh, this thing here is uh, exactly nothing but the magnetic field B square. So this contains the magnetic field component. So it's B vector square. Very nice term. Uh, this term, or one of the other terms, gives the electric field E square. And there are some other terms. OK, and now? Uh, we have some additional terms. So our A0 is changed. Our A0 is changed 
by the additional term coming from the j, so it's whatever it was before, plus 1 over m squared times j0. Then our a dot i is also changed. Our a dot i is uh, changed by whatever it was before, plus 1 over m squared times d i j0 from uh, this object here. And finally, our Lagrangian density is whatever it was before, minus j0 a0 minus j i a i. Okay. And if you take into account all those changes, then I will now simply write down the result that you obtain after plugging in everything. Are you able to plug this in yourself? If not, then I have to teach you how to do it. Is it still running? It's still running. <laughs> okay, so let me just copy the result here from my notes. In the end, after a few beautiful, entertaining steps of a calculation, you obtain the following result, j0 di pi i plus 1 over 2 m square j0 square plus j i a i. Okay, so, okay, some terms drop out and in the end you just obtain those three terms. And here you see again this uh, j0 square appears explicitly which is again completely non-Lorentz invariant. It's the same j0 square which also appeared in the previous example. And here you have an interaction between j0 and uh, the momenta. Here ji and ai and so on. And again, of course, if you would now uh, take the sum of the Hamiltonian, so this is the Hamiltonian from before and that is the free Hamiltonian without interactions. That is the interaction Hamiltonian. Then you can ask again, is the interaction Hamiltonian the same as minus the interaction Lagrangian? The interaction Lagrangian is simply this. This is our interaction Lagrangian. Beautiful, compact and Lorentz invariant. This is our interaction Hamiltonian, ugly and long and non-Lorentz covariant. So of course this is not the same. Okay. It's again one of those examples where this transition is not the same and it is also non-Lorentz covariant. Okay, and uh, however, this would be exactly what is needed in the operator approach. And now, of course, comes to the rescue, the path integral. What do we know? We know that, of course, at first we have a canonical formalism with this Hamiltonian and uh, the Hamiltonian satisfies all the conditions such that we know that the Hamiltonian path integral is definitely correct. So we have a correct well-defined starting point which is definitely this one where we integrate over the canonical variables which exist in our Hamiltonian setup. In the Hamiltonian setup there exist only the spatial components because A0 doesn't exist anymore. It is eliminated. So only AI exists and the pi i's, they also exist. And then our path integrand, let's say some abbreviated form, simply some operators which might depend on AI and maybe they also depend on the eliminated A0 which has been replaced by whatever it is according to the equations of motion. And then we have this exponent pi i AI dot minus h d4x. Okay. 
This path integral is definitely correct, and it gives us the usual left-hand side, the matrix element that we always had. And now we want to rearrange the path integral and make the transition to the Lagrangian. So in order to make the transition to the Lagrangian, we again integrate over the momentum variables. And therefore, we need to ask whether uh, we can again use Gauss integrals. And we can, because the Hamiltonian and the entire exponential here is quadratic in the pi's. The Hamiltonian is quadratic in the pi's. It contains here pi square with p factor 1 half, which is invertible and independent of uh, the other variables. Here we also contain pi square. The p factor is here a derivative, which is uh, non-trivial, but it still is not depending on the other fields, so it contains no dynamics. And uh, uh, then there are linear terms in the pi's, but basically the structure is such that we can do Gaussian integration. So Gauss applies. And therefore, if we do the integration over this pi i of x, then we have the usual rule, the integral or the integrand becomes just itself evaluated at the stationary point. The integrand becomes the original integrand, but evaluated at pi i equal pi i star, where uh, pi i star minimizes this exponent. In other words, a i dot is equal to the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to pi i at pi i equal pi i star. So and this is the definition of the Legendre transformation between the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian. Therefore, the integrand um, contains here the Lagrangian in the exponent, but not the original one, but this constrained Lagrangian. This constrained Lagrangian is the one which is connected to our Hamiltonian by Legendre. So from this integration, we will obtain this Lagrangian here. So the exponent becomes integral over this constraint Lagrangian integrated over d4x. So this is still not covariant. So, so far, the path integral has not completely rescued us. But we are not yet done. We can do something else. And we simply try now our hope. Because our hope would be the following. Our hope would be that we can use the naive path integral, which you know and love, where we integrate over all AMUs in a Lorentz covariant way, and where we simply have here the original Lagrangian. So let's simply try what happens if we plug in this one. Okay, So we have here the full Lagrangian without constraints. Here we integrate even over a zero even though this is a constrained variable, which doesn't exist in the Hamiltonian framework. And here we have in the operator our a0, which is the integration variable and not the one obtained by solving the equations of motion. So three differences. Let's just look at this path integral. What happens if we now evaluate the integral over the zero component? So let's write this as uh, ai and then another integral, a0, then here the operator, and the exponent. Okay. Now, let us evaluate the integral over the component, a0. 
So how does the integrand depend on A0? The integrand depends on A0. Here we have the original Lagrangian. The original Lagrangian was, of course, also quadratic in A0. Therefore, if we integrate over A0, we again get a Gaussian integral. And uh, the result is the same as always, namely uh, the A0 integral is done. And the remaining integrand remains what it is, but with the replacement that A0 is replaced by the stationary point of this, which means that A0 is replaced by its solution to its equation of motion, which is exactly this. Let's write it down. Gauss integral over A0 gets the same effect, namely A0 will become A0 solution of the equation of motion. And uh, therefore, the integral will be equal to this here. Also in the operator, A0 is replaced by the stationary point. And here in the exponential, we have this constraint Lagrangian integrated over d4x. And then you see that from this starting point here, which is the beautiful fully Lorentz covariant path integral, we get this. And this is exactly the same as what we get from the correct path integral by integrating over the momentum. So in other words, we have proven in this indirect way that the correct path integral is equal to this beautiful path integral. And therefore, we have derived our desired equality. Let me write it down. The correct path integral is equal to the following, namely to this. And this is, of course, completely manifestly Lorentz invariant. All the problems have miraculously disappeared. No constraints visible anymore. Just treat A0 just like all the other fields. Ignore that it is constrained. Just take the original Lagrangian even though not all variables are dynamical variables, and uh, integrate. That's it. And uh, if you want to know more about this, there is the book by Duncan, which contains this as an exercise 12.4 exercise. So you can look at this. And again, also Weinberg discusses it in section 7.5 and section 9.3, so Weinberg goes through the same kind of examples as we do here in the same order. Now I wonder whether actually the third example is necessary or whether we should skip it. The third example is even simpler than the second one. Maybe let me first clean the blackboard. And then you can think of whether you like um, to go through a third example. Maybe I will just write down the formulas. OK, so do you have, first of all, questions? Or so far, so good? OK. Um, how many more examples do you want to see? Uh, where is the joke? So none, maybe. OK, uh, oh, he has left. Oh, okay. So uh, then let me just write down what the third example is. But let us not calculate it. The third example would be QED plus gauge fixing. Uh, 
where we have the Lagrangian density minus 1 over 4 f mi nu f mi nu plus xi over 2 b square plus b times d mu a mu and uh, here you see first of all the normal QED Lagrangian f mi nu f mi nu the kinetic term of the photon and here you see now an auxiliary field the so-called Nakanishi Lautrup auxiliary field it has a name so let me write down the name and uh, this is exactly the form uh, of this general case with the QB variables and that is why I call them QB because this is the standard name for such auxiliary fields in quantum field theory and they appear exactly in the way the QB also has appeared before. Namely B square appears with a constant coefficient and B linearly appears multiplied with all the other fields including time derivatives of other fields and uh, B dot does not appear. Therefore B is clearly constrained, B dot uh, doesn't exist, there is no canonical momentum for B uh, and if you work out the equation of motion for B, the equation of motion for B is simply psi times B plus d mu a mu equals zero so you can eliminate uh, B by say setting B equal to minus one over psi times d mu a mu. And uh, so again, of course, this is constraint of second class because uh, the momentum of B and B itself are constrained. And so it's this typical pair of uh, variable and momentum, which is constrained. And so one can uh, now eliminate B in the Lagrangian, then quantize, go to the Hamiltonian, go to the path integral and so on. And uh, um, let us not do this. Um, but maybe let me just sketch it, could eliminate B using equation of motion, then we would obtain L constraint without B, then we would obtain the Hamiltonian density, we could canonically quantize And uh, that is what we did in quantum field theory 1b. And then we would have a correct path integral, which would contain the integral over a mu and over the canonical momenta pi mu. But it would not contain an integral over the Nakanishi Lautrup field b. And by going through exactly the same steps as in the previous example, we could prove that the correct path integral is actually equal to the following, namely we integrate over a mu and we integrate also over b and in the integrand we have the exponential of the original Lagrangian including the Nakanishi Lautrup field as simple as that. So again here it is true that you can completely ignore the constraints simply take the original Lagrangian take all fields integrate over all fields but not about the canonical momenta and that is the correct path integral for this theory. And if you now compare all three examples to this general case that I uh, outlined in the beginning, then you see that all examples are of this form. So this QB variables, uh, they appear always like this. So B square appears with a constant coefficient, B linearly times uh, some combination of time derivatives and variables. In the previous case, here, which was the most complicated, of course. Here also, actually, the A0 was the auxiliary field. A0 appeared in quadratic form with constant coefficient. A0 linearly appeared with some time derivative prefactors and so on. 
So all of the three examples were of the general form, and that is why in all three cases um, it works, and uh, you can prove it also in generality. So these are all very important examples that uh, one encounters in actual quantum field theory discussions. And therefore, we now know that in all these important examples, the path integral is the naive one that you get by ignoring all details and ignoring all difficulties and just writing down what you would immediately write down. That is true uh, in an established form for all the relevant cases. And so having established this, we can now come to another topic for which we have hopefully enough time. Do you have any questions? I remember that we considered the scale fixing when we quantized the free for entry. Hmm. And now my question is, um, why does this, uh, uh, what is the motivation? Why does this auxiliary field now come into play? Or what is it is motivated by uh, trying to put the QED quantization onto a more general footing. There are uh, very important and interesting, useful generalizations of QED where uh, the nakalishi lautrup field helps a lot. And therefore, including it in setting up the gauge fixing is very useful. At this point, um, there are no advantages. Uh, for example, the theory is also Lorentz invariant if you eliminate the B, which is what we had. So uh, there is no obvious disadvantage of the theory where B is eliminated but we will in the next section of the lecture uh, encounter cases where the B is actually advantages and then you will see. And then we will be able to come back to this case and we will immediately know how one can quantize a theory involving such a B. But for QED alone, B or no B uh, doesn't really matter. But it's nice to know that uh, what is going on here. Okay, permanent chalk. That's a new discovery. Amazing. By the way, as an exercise, I did not prepare an exercise sheet for this week, so I don't know, maybe you want to have some nice Easter vacation or whatever. But if you have nothing else to do and you are interested in it, then I would very strongly recommend as an exercise for what we did today to go exactly through the Weinberg chapters that I mentioned. Go through exactly those discussions of exactly the same examples where he provides you with some details and uh, you will see that uh, part of what he does corresponds to what we already did in quantum field theory one. Then you can go through the corresponding calculations and uh, the other part of what he does corresponds to what we did today. So you can read this up once again and fill in all the details of calculations. Okay, new topic, um, hopefully sufficient time on path integrals, namely path integrals for ground state expectation values and the appearance of the plus i epsilon prescription. So far, we have had path integrals for essentially position eigenstates, but we do not always want expectation values between position eigenstates, but very often, even more often, we want expectation values of the vacuum of the ground state. And so how can we get from here to expectation values of the ground state? Let us do this on the generic level of quantum mechanics with quantum mechanics notation, not quantum field theory. And let's first work in the Hamiltonian framework without Lagrangian. And we assume that there exists a unique ground state, which is the state of lowest energy of the Hamiltonian, which I call capital omega. And without loss of generality, 
we assume that uh, the eigenvalue is zero, otherwise we shift the Hamiltonian by a constant such that the eigenvalue becomes zero, uh, otherwise we get lots of phases which are irrelevant. Okay? So we have one ground state which uh, has zero energy and uh, then the Hamiltonian might have other eigenstates which we might call En where all the other ENs are bigger than zero. Then uh, our Heisenberg picture state Q comma t, which was the position eigenstate at time t, is of course given by e to the i h t times q at time zero. And let us now look at the following behavior. Let us look at the time t. What happens if we uh, make the time t very, very negative, very negative, but we give the time also a small imaginary part. So T becomes minus capital T times one minus I times epsilon, where epsilon is a fixed positive number, but small. By the way, I always use two different notations for epsilon. So there is this epsilon and the other epsilon, and here I use this epsilon, which is uh, called var epsilon in LaTeX. So I make this remark in every lecture. <laughs> okay, just to avoid confusion. You can call it whatever you like. But this is my uh, epsilon for such small infinitesimal positive numbers. Let's look at the behavior. Uh, if the time becomes very, very negative, but with a small uh, positive imaginary part. Okay, so then we have the following Q comma minus T times uh, one minus I times epsilon. This state is now the following E to the minus I Hamiltonian times T uh, and then E to the minus epsilon times t times the Hamiltonian acting on q at zero. So mm, here we have the usual imaginary exponent exponent and here we now have a real exponent with a negative um, number e to the minus epsilon times t times the Hamiltonian acting on this state. So what happens if the capital T becomes very large and ultimately goes to infinity? So in order to see what happens is uh, we insert a basis of Hamiltonian eigenstates. So this is a generalized sum or integral over all the energy eigenstates n. And let's do it like this. So we insert this basis here, n or en, we called it. En acting on q comma zero. Now, if you imagine that I insert this here, what I wrote here, this is just the unit operator because it's a full basis. If we insert this unit operator at this position, then what happens is that the Hamiltonians act on the energy eigenstates and get replaced by the exponential of the eigenvalues. And then the exponential of the eigenvalues is just a number. I can write them here. So let's write them here. e to the minus i eigenvalue en times t and e to the minus epsilon times t times en. And then I factored out to the left here the quantum state and everything that stands here is a number. And what happens to those numbers? To those numbers happens the following. For the ground state, we have the energy is equal to zero. And so for the ground state here, therefore, 
this exponential is just one and stays one for all t. For all the other states, en is positive. Then this term here is an exponential damping because here we have t goes to plus infinity, epsilon is fixed and positive, en is also fixed and positive, and therefore for all the other n, this is an exponential damping, and therefore all states go to zero except the ground state, which just stays in the sum. Therefore, for t going to plus infinity, this projects out the ground state, let's call it omega, uh, we called it omega, times uh, the scalar product of this. So the ground state is projected out. And at this point, I want to refer you to quantum field theory, uh, one from 1920. There, this was discussed in section uh, 2.4. We had an equivalent discussion in the operator formalism where this is part of the so-called uh, gelman low formu formula. And here it's part of the ground state discussion of the path integral. So anyway, uh, we now know uh, that you can get from a position eigenstate at very, very negative times with some imaginary part, you can go in the limit to the ground state. And so this is the connection between uh, our original path integral with position eigenstates and path integrals for the ground state. So in order to make this transition, we have to use that uh, trick of small imaginary paths and going to infinite times. Let's do the same for the opposite. So similarly, uh, take the opposite q comma plus t times one minus i epsilon. If, uh, so the left state, the time goes to plus infinity with a small negative imaginary part, the same thing happens and it becomes for t going to plus infinity, it becomes this scalar product times the ground state. And so therefore, uh, the result is that in the limit, so it's, I think it's unfortunately hard to read. Maybe I can write here. So in the limit, t going to plus infinity of the following expression, qf evaluated at positive times times one minus i epsilon, then any operators, then qi at time minus t times one minus i epsilon. This path integral with imaginary uh, parts of the times, t goes to plus infinity, this gives a constant times the vacuum expectation value of the same operators. And this constant comes from these scalar products here, which are just some numbers which we don't know. But anyway, they don't depend on t in the limit. They are really constants. And so in this way, we can project out the vacuum expectation value of whatever operators we want just by only looking at position eigenstate expectation values but taking this uh, particular limit. And interestingly, it doesn't matter which position eigenstate you choose, in the end, in the limit, the result always becomes the same, except the constant might depend on what position eigenstate you choose, but otherwise it's completely irrelevant. And so therefore, let me we just write down what that means for the path integral. So I would maybe end the lecture with a path integral formula for the ground state, but we need some space, uh, which is hard to get since we cannot clean. That's really weird. <laughs> 
friction? You mean like that? Pop you. That's really stupid. I think it's not really much better. So I do not want you to leave without seeing the formula for the path integral which gives you the ground state expectation value. Maybe let's use some colors, maybe orange, not orange, green. There is also green, but I think green is kind of not useful. Uh, okay, where were we? Uh, we know the path integral formula for this. So now up to the constant, we now know how to get the path integral for that. And so therefore, we have the following. Uh, so just as a guiding principle, in the path integral, oh, that looks nice. So the Hamiltonian would be replaced by itself times one minus i epsilon, so the Hamiltonian uh, will now be multiplied with a small imaginary part, which you can interpret as the Hamiltonian minus i epsilon times something which is positive definite. Because the Hamiltonian is of course positive definite, so applied on any state it gives some, something positive, and so this is uh, the important thing here which multiplies the plus i epsilon. Then uh, in the path integral, we always had the integral over time. This is now replaced, of course, by an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity over time. And the endpoints are irrelevant. So the endpoints qi and qf, they are irrelevant as we just said. So let me then write down the formula for the Lagrangian. If the Lagrangian form is correct, then we can immediately write down the path integral formula for this. Namely, the vacuum expectation value of some time-ordered product of operators. is up to a constant, the path integral dq of t times all the operators times e to the i times the action. That's just it. And here the path go up to infinity with arbitrary boundary conditions. And now the convergence of the integral, even though time goes to plus minus infinity, is of course guaranteed by the minus i epsilon. And so if you have time, let me assume that you have still one or two minutes more of time, then we can do a slight uh, other nice form of the same thing, namely what is actually the constant. The constant can be obtained as follows, namely if you remove here the operators in between, then on the left hand side you simply have the scalar product of the vacuum with itself. <coughs> 
vacuum, vacuum is the norm of the vacuum state is 1. And then on the right hand side you have the same constant times the path integral without the operators. So the constant can be divided out. Uh, it's just uh, the norm of the vacuum divided by that other path integral without operators and so therefore combining it we can write it in the following way which I now do namely T O1 let's forget about the arguments it's always the same this is now a ratio of two path integrals namely in the denominator let's start with there we have the path integral of just the action with no operators that gives this constant and in the numerator we have the path integral of all the operators times e to the i times the action and so this is of course a beautiful form for vacuum expectation values of arbitrary time ordered products of operators and that is very similar to the Gelman law formula uh, which is a formula in the canonical formalism which uh, we derived in that quantum field theory lecture in the operator formalism where similar tricks are used. All right we have now learned a lot of important building blocks for quantum field theory and in particular those vacuum expectation values they are extremely important objects in quantum field theory uh, probably the most important objects that one can calculate and so here we now have a path integral representation for those uh, vacuum expectation values of time ordered products this is the building block from which you can construct everything observables, scattering, amplitudes, everything else and so we now have the full general expression for it. Okay, having said that, thanks for your attention, have a nice Easter and then see you next week.